The text upon which we base our meditation today is the gospel lesson. I'd just like to repeat the first two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, over the last three weeks, we've had different looks at who our God is and what he expects from us. And if I had pulled them from three different parts of the Bible, we might say, well, there's the flavor of Isaiah, and there's the flavor of Paul and the Corinthians, and now here's in Luke. But for this last three weeks, it's all been in Luke, in these three different chapters, as we've looked at who God is and how he wants us to behave. Because a couple of weeks ago, the text started out with something as simple as, you know, the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, you know, Herod's out to get you. You might want to leave this area. Get out of Galilee, get out of Perea, head down to Judea. And he sort of mocks at that, that, you know, Herod, <laughs> he's not going to get me yet. And don't worry about me because I can't die unless I'm in Judea because that's where all your prophets have been killed before. So I might as well join them down there. And at the same time, as he was reaching out to these people and talking to them, we looked at the fact that Jesus is still trying to be patient with these people. Even though Herod had killed John the Baptist by this time, Jesus still had hope and that he might reach him somehow. And even on that last trial of Jesus on that Monday, Thursday, Good Friday morning, where he sent to Herod and giving Herod a chance to understand, do you understand who I really am? Even without giving a lot of answers, but I don't care if I get killed. I don't care if you participate in this. I don't care if you allow this to happen because it's what I'm here for. And especially with the Pharisees, instead of thinking these are the enemy, I should just fry them now. Jesus didn't think that way. He was patient with them. He was tolerant with them. And think about how that even brought about some successes. Think of something as simple as like the verse of the day from John chapter 3, verse 16. Who did he say that to? It was a member of the Sanhedrin. A body that had already decided early in Jesus' ministry, he's a heretic, he's, a her he, he's an apostate, he's not a true Jew, he's teaching these other things, and eventually they end up condemning him because they think he claims to be God, which he did and didn't deny. But when he says that in John chapter 3, verse 16, that man from the Sanhedrin is Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night because he didn't want his friends to find out. He didn't want them to know that though they all had decided this Jesus was a wacko type person and needed to be dealt with, he saw the compassion. He saw the patience. He saw the tolerance. He heard the message. He saw the miracles. And that's what he told Jesus. You, you, you're different. What they may rumor about you and fake news about you, it's not true. And so Jesus tells him the main reason he came, which is summarized in God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. Now we don't know when Nicodemus' heart changed. We don't know when he came to say, that guy is my Lord and my Savior. But we do know when he eventually did it in public. Because after the crucifixion, he came to Pilate with his friend Joseph of Arimathea and said, we want the privilege, the honor of taking that body down the cross and burying it. <coughs> and we don't have to guess, Nicodemus lost his job on the Sanhedrin. They had decided this guy was a heretic and blasphemer and deserving of death, and for Nicodemus to say, I want the honor and privilege of burying him, he wasn't welcome back. He would have to find something else to do for a living. And that's why when we looked at that a couple of weeks ago with that reminder of that Jesus' patience with all sinners, me included, you included, and his tolerance for the things we do wrong and yet he still cares about us and walks alongside of us even though every Sunday we have to remind ourselves to repent again because it's another week where we've done things in our thoughts and things in words and maybe less deeds wrong this week but there's still some there that we need to apologize and hear those words of absolution 
that you and I are totally forgiven. All of our sins are taken away. But then last week, we went through a portion of God's word in Luke that reminds us that we got to be careful about how far we push God. Which is why I mentioned that there was a person that came up to me at either a funeral or a wedding, because it's happened more than once, and asked the question that was simply, how many times can I do the same sin on purpose before God gets mad? And as I said last week to you, I said, you wouldn't ask a question like that because you wouldn't be that stupid. You might bring it up in Bible class. I have a friend that said something like this, but you wouldn't do that to me on purpose because you know better. How many times can I say this, do the same sin, Pastor, before God gets mad? You wouldn't do that because you know what the next question would be, and that sin is. But we still have people around us, and maybe it goes through our brain once in a while. How long can I keep this pet sin, or is it really that bad of a sin that it's not that terrible so I can keep doing it without being feeling guilt about it? And the reminder from our text last week was, look what God did to the Israelites from time to time in the wilderness under the leadership of Moses. And that none of them, of that generation that was over 20 that got out of Egypt, made it to the promised land except Caleb and Joshua. Even Moses messed up enough that he said, you're only not going to get into that promised land on earth. Now when Moses died, we know he went to heaven and he's there. We've got day of transfiguration to confirm that. So it doesn't mean that he had no faith. It didn't mean he lost his faith. He wasn't judged eternally. But God said, enough is enough. On a day I wanted you to preach the gospel to the people, you preach the law. You misrepresented me. You don't get to go into the promised land. And so with last week's sermon, we're looking at, oh, okay, now what do we need to do? Well, just Jesus was telling the people quite plainly that day, don't worry about those people that died in the tower, and don't worry about those people that died in, in the temple when Pilate killed them. What you need to do is always remember you need to repent. And repentance is not just apologizing, it's changing your ways. And when we looked at that little parable at the end of that, where Jesus is the gardener who is told to cut down the tree that's not bearing fruit, he says, give me it some time. I'll work with it. I'll root around it. We'll prune it. We'll do these other things. It still has hope. That's that reminder that Jesus will work with us. He just doesn't say, do this better on your own. There's that reminder. You want some help in this area? You want some help trying to change this? I'll help you. Let me. Use my word to feed your soul. Worship me on a regular basis to get your faith stronger. I'll help you do the things I would like you to do. I'm not just telling you to do it on your own. I'll help you with this. Because eventually there will be a judgment day. Now today, we have this parable of the lost son. In the old King James, it was the prodigal son. And the only conclusion when I look at this view of God is he's a flaming liberal. Among us conservative Republicans at Peace Lutheran Church, he's a flaming liberal. I mean, there's some Democrats in here? <laughs> yes, there are. Shh. Shh. But are we conservative? Yes, we are. When it comes to our theology, not politics, but when it comes to our theology, we are conservative. We actually believe God created the world in six days. Why? Because God said so. We believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day on what we call Easter Sunday now because God said so. We're going to live in a place for eternity where it's going to be a wonderful to live for eternity. Why? Because God said so. We conservatively believe that this book actually was put together by the Holy Spirit through various people writing through 1,500 year different time period to let you know from Moses all the way to John in Revelation, the one plan of salvation and who the central message of that is. The candles on the left side point ahead to the coming on Christ and the candles on the right side point back to the coming of Christ. So we got a menorah on both sides. We got Jews and Greeks covered. But this story, he's a flaming liberal. The son comes and asks for his inheritance now. He doesn't want aid for dad to die. And the dad goes, okay, who does that? If you heard one of your friends did that, what would you say about their parenting methods? If you heard a, a grown adult 
had a son or daughter come to them in their 20s and 30s and says, I want it now. And you write them a check. What would you say to that friend? Would we use helicopter parent? Would we use enabler? Or would we have some other choice words about that person? And yet God is saying this about himself. The son came. He asked for something. Okay. I'll cut you a check now and have it. And then the son's like, well, this is cool. And he goes off by himself. And he messes up. When he's really, really down and he's got nothing left, it wasn't part of our text today because we had the dot, dot, dot on the back of the bulletin. But he comes to his senses, my servants are, my dad's servants are better off than I am right now. I'll go ask if I can be one of them. He was smart enough to think, I can't go back and ask for the right of sonship, but maybe I can be a servant in my father's house when he heads back. Then the father sees him from way off, and the flaming liberal father it's just cool. No, I told you so. You deserve to go to your room first. None of those things, but let's celebrate. Let's have a big party. Let's kill the fattened calf. And on we go. Even the other brother knows this is stupid. Now, we may have sermons, and I may have had a sermon on him in the past about judging others and not being able to give forgiveness to others that maybe have done some sins that are worse than yours, so be careful about that. That is part of that lesson. But in some ways, the son is right. Because if the bad son, the younger son, already got his inheritance, who owns everything else that's left? Well, the older son. Who's fat and calfed are they killing to celebrate with the younger son? That was mine. You didn't ask permission to take one of my calves and give it to the bad brother. And I have no trouble understanding this guy because he makes sense to everybody in the world except this liberal, forgiving, overlook all the problems father. Do you ever have a trouble figuring out how God works? Good. <laughs> Good. He's not simple. He's not simple. God is complicated. People that want to try and say, I know God and exactly how he works in any given situation or how he blesses or how he doesn't bless, have a little God. they got a pocket God. They're almost their own makeup God. Some people do do that. They sort of try and treat God like the magic genie. They ignore him, ignore him and whatever he says, but whenever they need him, they rub their hands together on the magic genie of prayer and ask God for help. And if they get the help or the things change and they're out of the situation, then back in the lamp, we put you up on the shelf. Don't tell me what to do. Some people treat God sort of like the fire extinguisher. You get him out in times of emergencies. And then when you're not dealing with him, just, oh, every once in a while, we we'll refresh him once a year on Christmas Eve because... Code says we got to recharge our fire extinguisher once a year. But there's also other people that are very deathly afraid of God and think he can't forgive anything. Remember me talking about Ora Schultz, who passed away a number of years ago. She was up in a care center up there off on Park Crest, the Mill Plain. And for the last five years of her life, she was saying, I don't know why I'm still here. Why God doesn't take me to heaven. I want to go. And she had no real major problems. I mean, she could get from her chair to her walker to her wheelchair, get down to meals, come back. But she just was had enough life. She was in her early 90s. And so she just, her attitude was, God must have me here for some purpose. I need to witness to somebody, get them converted, and then I can go to heaven. So up at that care center where she lived, every new resident got witness to Every one of them got witness to, probably more than once, because Oren thought, I need somebody to become a believer to get out of this place and to get to heaven. But she said, Pastor, you know the frustrating part with witnessing to the people? She says, some of them just 
And he she says, and this is the most frustrating one that hits me. She says, when they tell me to go away or shut up, I can live with that. Sort of used to that, that what you're talking about is stupid. There is no heaven. There is no hell. We live, we die. And she says, those I can understand. She says, it's the ones who say, that's a nice thing you believe. It's too late for me. Those are the frustrating ones, Pastor, because they like what I say. They like what I believe. But they think it's too late for them, that that's too easy, that God would forgive everything. They don't have enough time to change their ways, amend their ways, and show God that they're really sorry. So they're <coughs> satisfied, not satisfied, but just like, oh well. Pastor, how do I get through to them? I said, try this one from Luke. <laughs> And so she tries this parable of the lost son with those people. And they still got the same result. That's just a story. That can't be how God really works. It's too easy. There's no justice. It's not right. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not just. Whoever said God is fair. Now, I'll say that a little further away from you so you don't get fried with the lightning bolt when I say that, but God is not fair. God is not fair. He killed his son so I won't have to suffer for my sins. That's not fair. I'm glad about that. And yet... My conservative nature still wants everything to be fair. Somebody speeds down my road, I want them to get a ticket. Somebody busts through my fence, I want them to get punished. A whole crowd out there is with Pokemon on certain nights of the week, like 12, 15 of them are gathered out there, so the neighbor across the street thinks I got a wedding rehearsal. I want the internet to go dead. That's not fair. That's mean. But get out of my yard. God killed his son. So you and I get to go to heaven for free. Is the truth. Whether you're liberal or conservative in politics, the truth of God's word is the truth of God's word. He will tell us once in a while with the law, enough is enough. So we have things like Isaiah that say, God has had enough. He's going to allow us as a nation to get conquered. Judah didn't learn, so they got conquered as a nation. Yet God still uses that law in punishing people who don't listen to help others. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go as refugees and live in Babylon. Where did the wise men come from at the time of Christ? From the East. Where'd they get that information? How did they know the truths? Because God in his love allowed some of his people to go through some problems. So they had to move and they would share their faith with others and others would get blessed. I am a puny little person. God has the big picture. Is God more complicated than I would like him to be? Would I like to be able to explain him simply to everybody all the time? Oh, sure I would. That I can understand God, let me tell you how. With my vast knowledge and brain, I can tell you all about God. <laughs> God is more than the Wizard of Oz. He's not just behind a curtain. There's a little man back there manipulating things. He's God. But he's a God who loves us and cares about us. And is really nice and asks us to believe in him and trust him. But the reason I repeated a simple little phrase, which isn't really part of the parable, but is the introduction to the parable, when the Pharisees and the teachers' law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They were judging Jesus for being nice and welcoming. 
and what joy it is to know that is who Jesus is. Oh, I use my imagination. You know what it's going to be like to eat dinner with Jesus someday? I mean, even in Psalm 23, David talks about the table spread before him. I can you imagine someday when I got my grandmas and my grandpas, my aunts and uncles, my 36 or so cousins, my kids, my daughters, my grandchildren, and Jesus comes over. Or we go to Jesus' place. I'm not sure how I want to take this picture. And we sit down and talk with him, and he talks with us. He knows who I am. Glad you believed in me. Was it worth it? <laughs> and we hang out. Am I worthy of such treatment? An honor? No. But will I get it? Yes. Will you get it? Yes. Because he's that awesome. That I know about God. I know he gives me my law that's there to fight that little Adam, old Adam that's still part of my life. And he gives me his good news to strengthen that new man that has that relationship with him. And so I struggle as I get through this life with doubts and fears and faith going down from time to time. And then with confidence and inspiration and faith going up from time to time. So I let him feed me what he wants to do. And strengthen that confidence in who he is and where he wants me to spend eternity. And use my imagination on how awesome that's going to be. May God bless you in that same way. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.